you've come to the right place. If you're looking to create, launch, and scale a high value online training program. I'm your guide, Chris Badgett. I'm the co-founder of Lifter LMS, the most powerful learning management system for WordPress. Stay to the end. I've got something special for you. Enjoy the show. Hello and welcome back to another episode of LMS Cast. I'm joined by a special guest today. Her name is Lisa Bloom. She's from story-coach.com. We're going to get into the incredible power of story today, uh, just to help you in your life, but also to help you in your courses to understand what you're doing, how to communicate better. Welcome to the show, Lisa. Thank you. It's great to be here. I'm excited to get into it with you. Uh, I was on your website and I noticed um, the first part about uh, using story to succeed is to articulate what you do in a way that attracts your clients, to get clear and confident about how your business helps other people, and then to achieve what you're really here to do in the world. So those are all like awesome. But just to Mm -hmm. frame it in, um, what is the story advantage? And you also have a book by that title that people should check out. Like what, what does that mean? Like when we really harness a story, what does that unlock? I think, you know, the most powerful thing about story is its ability to connect you with others and to build trust without even trying. So when you tell a story that's compelling, that the person listening feels, you know, they want to listen. They just want to, they want to hear you get this engagement level that's like no other. And people begin to identify with the story and therefore identify with you as the storyteller. It builds an incredible connection between you and the you know, you and your audience. And, you know, they they instinctively trust you because you're telling a story that feels real. And of course, I have to have this caveat in place that this is not the story that tries to manipulate people to do the things you want them to do, right? This is the real story. This is an authentic story of your experience or a story that moves you, a story that you feel connected to, even if it's not your own story, but it's somebody else's with permission that you're telling. That level of authenticity, you you can't fake it. And when it's there, it builds this incredibly memorable experience for the listener. So we we come away from an experience like that and we we really mull over the story. We think about it, we're connected to it, we remember it. And maybe we don't remember the details of the story, but we remember how it made us feel. And so there's something very deep happening. And I've had situations where people have literally years later come back to me and reminded me of a story that I told that I'd even you know, I'd forgotten I told it or I'd forgotten I'd met the person, but they had remembered the story. For like a course creator or coach type person, what does it look like when we're communicating without story? Like what's what's missing or what is it, you know, what does that look like? Well, there's a few ways it can look. I mean, one way it can look is fairly transactional. So it doesn't feel like there's a connection between you and, you know, that that it's really about just kind of pure business. Um, but the other way it can look is it can feel too kind of practiced and perfect and not authentic. So you hear people who have this perfect sentence that they've built around what they do. You know, I, um, you know, I offer this to this type of type person or, you know, whatever that transformational sentence is. And, and it feels kind of like the sentence you'd hear from lots of other people who do the same thing. So I used to go to these coaching conferences because as a coach and I would say to people, what do you do? And they'd say, oh, I'm a coach and I work with people who want to transform their lives or whatever it is. And I would hear blah, 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 blah. You know, really nice, smart people who had a lot to offer. I love coaches. They're, they're doing great things in the world. And yet the language just would leave me feeling completely cold. But when I would dig in and say, oh, so tell me more about that. Tell me about, you know, how did you get into it? How did you get started? What's your story? suddenly I would hear these incredible things and I would think to myself, why didn't you say that in the first place? And I would have been engaged from the first moment. I wouldn't have had to dig deep to find out who you are. And so I started to to help people do that, to discover, well, what is the story that can connect them to the prospect, to the potential client? And when they started telling those stories, suddenly the magic happened in their business. I have a nuanced question for you. Um, If you're an expert or a coach or you're, you're trying to help somebody, how does the story of the expert interact with the story of the client or the customer? Because there's like two stories there. We're, we're on our own story paths. How does, how does the resonance happen there between those two stories? 
Well, there's there's a few things here. Firstly, what you know, in order to become an expert, you've experienced certain things. Oftentimes, the pain that has, you know, transformed you into the expert. If people who have, you know, for example, let's say, I don't know, weight loss coach, oftentimes they're people who've struggled in their life with their health and wellness. And so when they talk about their struggle, that connects with the prospective client, but they also talk about how they've transformed their struggle. That's the next part of their story. And that becomes inspiring for the client, for the prospect. So our, our stories connect on the basis of us being willing to open up to the places that we've experienced pain and struggle, but also to continue to talk about what we've done about it and how we've managed to somehow get beyond that. And we only have to be a little bit ahead of our clients to be able to inspire them to take those next steps. So I think that's the first part. But the other part as well is that, you know, we need to tell the stories that resonate with our audience, because if it doesn't resonate, if it's not relevant to them, it's just not interesting. So if we become the hero of our own story, then we're, we're telling stories for the mirror. You know, we're telling stories for our ego. What we have to do is tell a story that helps the audience identify themselves as the hero, the potential for what they can become, that becomes the hero. And then suddenly it's like, it's about them. So if you're telling a story because you need to tell it, because you need it for your own well-being or for your own ego or for whatever it may be, or for your own healing, then that's a story you need to tell, but just not in business. You need to tell it to your, your therapist or your partner or your, your friends. The story you need to tell in your business is the story that serves the audience that you want to serve, that you want to connect with, that you want to be there for. And that becomes a very transformational experience for them. That's awesome. What do you say to people that um, have self worth <clears throat> around or self worth or imposter syndrome around the value of the story of their lives, or they feel like they don't have enough for it to make a good story? What would you say to people like that? Well, can I tell a little story to? <laughs> yeah, yeah, please do. <laughs> I, I I've done a lot of work in corporate over the years, and I remember going into a corporate client, and the minute I walked in the door, she said to me, "Oh, Lisa, we had an amazing inspirational speaker yesterday. It was this guy who he was a fighter jet pilot, and he had to eject from his plane, and he crash landed, and he ended up, you know, in a coma for six months, and then he woke up, and then he did this, and then he did that, and he became an Olympic athlete, and you know, this incredible story." And I said to him, you know, I'm thinking, wow, that's awesome. And I knew of this speaker and I said to her, you know, that's, he's, I know this guy's incredible. And I've heard he's a brilliant speaker. And I said to her, but to be honest, I'm much more interested in the small stories in the little stories of our day-to-day -day lives, because they're the things that our audience can relate to. And they're the things that actually matter in our lives and that people feel connected to. And People who feel like, well, I don't have a story. You don't have to have a, you know, jump out of an airplane near death experience in order to have an interesting story. You have to have insight into the, these incredibly magical moments that happen every day in our lives that a lot of time we're just, we just don't notice. And I remember years and years ago, one of my the first coaches I ever hired to help me with my business, she said to me, Lisa, if you want to build an audience, you've got to tell a story every week and you've got to send it out in a newsletter. And my first response was, you know, my, my life's just not that interesting. You know, I'm a mother, I've got a bunch of kids. I, you know, I live an ordinary life. I'm trying to build a business. I'm trying to be a coach. Like th there's nothing interesting there. And she said, oh, Lisa, I trust you. And from that day on, I wrote a blog of a story. I told a story every week for 10 years, religiously. I did not miss a week. And I discovered in the tiny moments, the amazing potential for story, for compelling story. And I built an audience of thousands of people over the years because people were waiting to hear the story every week. And again, it's not that my life got any more interesting. My life was still an ordinary life like most people live. It still is. But I honed into those what I call these pivotal moments, these moments in life where something happens that slightly changes us, where something happens that's unexpected and the world feels a little bit different after than it was before. And that's the, the seed, that's the potential for great story. And when you can hone into those moments and tell them as a story, you capture people because they're moments that they recognize in their life that they're probably missing too. So you don't need to have had this crazy, exciting, you know, amazing experiences in your life to, to tell. And sometimes when you do, they're less compelling than the little moments. Um, 
yeah so and, and it's very very common people say that to me all the time but i assure them that it's the the most compelling stories are, are the interesting little moments that we almost miss that are so precious that we should be able to capture them how do you um what or what's your story around getting so into story like how did you end up here helping people in this way yeah i mean i so so there's a kind of a um I think the, the reality is I was always interested in story. I was an avid reader from a very early age. I used to steal my mother's um, book club books. You know, she was in a book club and I would secretly read all her books. And I always loved story. And I had a vivid story based imagination as a child. Um, I grew up in Ireland. I grew up in a Jewish family. So I say I'm genetically predispositioned to be connected to story being Irish Jewish. Um, but aside from that, um, I think that... Uh, I just, I was always interested, you know, I studied literature, I studied film and television, I was always interested in story, I was always moved by story, and I was the kid who always went to my, the older members of my family, my grandparents and my aunts and uncles, and would say to them, so what was it like when, you know, what was it like when you, when you were living here, or when you grew up there, or when you got married, I was always interested in that, Um, as I got older, I kind of let it go for many years. I went into business, I went into, you know, to university, business school, whatever. Um, but I was always fascinated by stories. And I began to see the potential for story as I went into my own business and realized that people were just not very good at talking about what they do in a compelling way. And at the same time, I trained as a professional storyteller. So I went through, you know, I, I kind of fell in love with it. And I remember the day I went to my first professional storytelling event and I walked into the room and I had this amazing feeling like the walls were shaking, like, oh, this is this is who I am. This is what I do. And I didn't know it was called this. And I think that's an experience that many people have in, in lots of things that they do. You know, they, they become a coach and like, oh, that's what I've been doing all my life. And I didn't realize or they build a course and like education. That's what I've always wanted to do. And I think being able to identify that moment where you're passionate about something and then share it with somebody, firstly, that's a gift to you. It's a gift to them, but it's also a great story. And um, yeah, I, I don't know if that answers the question, but that's, uh, that's where I've got to. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, what about story structure? Like how does somebody kind of put some uh, framing around what to say or, or what, what, to, what to tell. I mean, we have lots of stories. So and there's kind of like these big meta stories and these small stories, like you mentioned in your newsletter from the day to day. How do we structure a story if we feel like we don't know how to tell one? So I think that, um, you know, there's lots of different theories of story structure and, you know, stories have to have a middle and a, you know, beginning, middle and end. And they have to have a, you know, there's all these different structures. You can look up story structure and you'll get all the models in the world, you know, look it up in Google or whatever. What, to me, what's interesting is you have a person who's experiencing a challenge and something happens um, that shifts their experience. They may be experiencing a challenge or they may be, um, <clears throat> They may not be, they may be in some kind of status quo, but something happens and that's the pivotal moment concept. Something happens that changes them emotionally, intellectually, spiritually, whatever. Um, and as a result of that, there's an outcome and that outcome sets them on a different trajectory. What's important about the characters, we need to care about them. They need to be somebody that for some reason matters. I remember years ago, I was creating a story for an event and I would often test my stories out on my kids. And I remember saying, telling the story to my son and, I, and he said to me, um, he said to me, I don't really care about her. And I said, oh really, why? And he said, I don't know, I don't care. Like maybe she needs to be an orphan or something. <laughs> this is my, my kid, he was like 12 at the time or 14 at the time. And I said, really, she needs to be an orphan. He said, well, something bad has to happen so I can relate to her because if she's just some princess, like what do I care? Who am I relating to, you know? So I realized in that moment, it was years and years ago, I remember um, realizing we have to feel some connection to the protagonist to care about what happens to them. And then what happens to them, we're, we're invested and we want to know and we want to learn something. So that's kind of the way the story will flow. That's awesome. How do we think about story in, in marketing? I mean, I know we can do like a video. Video seems kind of like a natural medium for storytelling, but there's also like if we have a sales page and we're using words, like how do we integrate features and benefits with story? 
Yeah, I mean, I think there's opportunities to use stories in lots of different ways in marketing, as you said, um, in a sales page, for sure. I mean, they're in the flow of a sales page, whether it's a long page or a short page, you've always got an opportunity to um, to to tell a story of a past client or somebody who you've worked with or your own story to show the transformational potential of the work you're going to do with them. And I, I, ideally, on any given sales page, you would have several of those stories embedded in the page. Um, stories are also articulated through testimonials. So they're in the words of your client who talk about what, you know, what was the before, what was the after, and what happened to make that happen, which was obviously the work they did with you. So we, we have opportunities to use stories. And people are mis often mistaken where they think that, well, if I give a one line of here's the results, you know, such and such a person made ten thousand dollars from doing this uh, this particular you know process that i taught them that's not a story but if you talk about the person and you give them some character and you talk about what they were struggling with and who they were and where they lived and what they looked like and what their problem was and and you kind of really give some life to the individual and then you talk about it, people get invested they you know they can see the person and then they feel like okay I, I care about what happens to them and then when you understand what they've struggled with and then you see their outcome they celebrate with them and they're really impacted by the story so you can't just give a one liner of the results people make that mistake and think that's the story that you have to actually have to build it out a little bit and and get people invested in get people to care like why should i care about that person like my son didn't care about the princess you know why should i care and then once you've embedded that then people are impacted by it do you have like an example or two of like <clears throat> a coach or course creator whose story or their ability to deliver it is so good and powerful that it the success of their business was pretty inevitable or it just worked really well um like somebody that uh, just, just so we could look, kind of look at a great story example of transformation that just magnetizes and attracts people and that whatever that niche or pain is. Yeah. I mean, the first one that comes to mind is the person who, you know, the coach, <clears throat> excuse me, a health and wellness coach who, um, I, I always come back to this example because, um, I could really relate to it. It was a person who, um, was involved in a corporate career for many, many years. I started out in corporate and, and she was climbing the corporate ladder and was doing really well and was kind of piling on the pans every year without really noticing. But um, as a person who, as a young person, she was a swimmer and she would run and so on. She, over the years, um, became less and less um, active because she was in this huge corporate career and being extremely successful. But she got to the point midlife where she began to feel like I've become this different person I'm successful and yet I feel horrible you know and my body feels horrible my energy levels are horrible I'm you know eating junk food I'm not moving I'm feeling awful and then she started that incredible journey that most people go through where you know they try the diets and they try the routines and they try you know they try all these different things and it just helped her add on more and more pounds but ultimately, she did find a way, a particular system, and that system got her through. She lost, you know, 30 pounds. She became active. She became, she just really did phenomenally well. Um, and most importantly, managed to maintain it for a few years. And that coincided with her realizing that that journey she went through was so much more meaningful than anything she could have achieved in her corporate career. And so she made the choice to leave corporate and to become a health and wellness coach and now works with women in that field to, to do a similar thing, to go on a similar journey that she went on. And that story, which is like, you know, she, she lived it, she understands it, she gets it. And it's so perfect for the niche that she chose that um, it was just incredibly compelling and she became very, very successful with the story. And when she started out, she was like, oh, I'm so new to coaching. How am I ever going to you know, be credible. I'm like, what are you talking about? Your <laughs> life is credible, you know? Or another one, <clears throat> a woman who um she uh she had a um uh <clears throat> excuse me, she had like this blended family. Her partner had a couple of kids and she had a couple of kids that got together, had a few kids, and it was kind of like a Brady Burns scenario. And years later got really, really interested in parenting um advice and studied coaching and parenting, whatever. 
and went into um, started putting together parenting groups. And she was somebody who also came to me and said, you know, I have to build my credibility and I have to figure out like how I'm going to convince people that I know what I'm doing. <laughs> it's just like, you've got so many stories. You've got a lifetime, the last 15 years of bringing up these kids from all these, you know, in this way and building up a successful family and reaching out to your friends and your family and helping them with their issues in families. And it was only when she leaned into her own stories and the stories of the people that she'd actually interacted with throughout the years that she built up the confidence and the kind of repertoire that she could share with people that just the credibility and the trust was there, it was embedded. That's awesome. Do you have any advice for people <laughs> that may uh, have stage fright around um, telling their story <clears throat> particularly, especially if it involves some like uh, vulnerability or you know it, talking publicly about something they're not used to talking about yeah um so I suffer from stage fright pretty seriously which is crazy seeing as I'm I've been a speaker for the last 15 years and I've spoken on stages across the world um but I still suffer from stage fright um and I have a process that really helps me and I'm you know it's it's um solid and, and it works so I still get scared but I still manage to do it and that's fine um, but I think one of the things that is a mistake that's out there um, is people think you have to be vulnerable in order to in order to um, to appeal to people. And vulnerability has its place and vulnerability is super important, but not for the sake of vulnerability. I think that's an important distinction. You shouldn't be vulnerable because you have to be vulnerable and you should never tell a story that you're not ready to share. So I'm I'm pretty much an open book and I, you know, tell stories about pretty much everything, but I still there are certain things I don't talk about because I'm not ready to share them because they're too personal or it would make me feel unsafe in some ways or another. And I think everybody is in that situation. There is nothing worse than listening to somebody tell a story that is pushing them beyond the place that they're comfortable because it's really uncomfortable for the audience. It's inappropriate and it feels almost abusive it's it's really not a good thing so I think the first thing you have to do is think about well am I ready to share this story and and more importantly than that than am I ready to share the story is is this story of service to others does this story serve people to a certain end and to an end that serves the reason I'm here in the first place and if the answer to that is yes great like let's figure out how to get yourself to a comfortable place and part of it is to be able to create a distance between the experience and 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 how you feel about it and to understand the transformation in the experience so for many many years my, my father died very very suddenly and I couldn't talk about it for, for years I couldn't talk about it It was just too painful and um there was a certain point in time when I realized actually um the story that I was telling about his death was holding me back about you know how unfair it was how awful it was how sudden it was how you know traumatic it was when I flipped that story and started talking about him as a person, I was able to talk about him and tell stories about him in a way that felt wonderful. And people would say to me, gosh, if I didn't know he'd passed away, I think he lived down the street, you know, and it, and it never held me back anymore. And it felt vulnerable because yes, this is a part of who I am and what I care about and part of my, my personal life. But if it's relevant to the audience that I share something about him or about my experience of of telling his story, then I'm going to do it because it serves the audience and I have enough distance and enough ability to tell my own, like that inner story to myself. Because you have to remember the outer story, the story we tell others is always dependent on the inner story, the story we tell ourselves. And if they're not integrated well, then we kind of get lost. We tell stories that feel inauthentic or we tell stories that are oversharing and are over vulnerable and we have to get that ba that balance right and that balance is created by really doing the work on our inner story what's the story we're telling ourselves about the situation are we ready to tell it to others in a way that will feel safe and feel powerful and most importantly inform them and inspire them and be relevant for them that's awesome um if somebody's <clears throat> kind of separating out story to like, okay, maybe I'll write a biography or memoir one day, and they just kind of keep work and personal and separate buckets. Can you speak to that and like why maybe an integrated approach might be beneficial? I think we can't help it, to be honest. 
like I think our own life experience will show that it's very difficult to separate and compartmentalize our life into all these places. And I think that, uh, and, and people do it, but I think what they do is that they create much more transactional relationships in their work than the people who are a little bit more fluid in the way they move in and out of their stories. I um, feel that being authentic and sharing a part of yourself is as much of a gift to you as it is to your client, but it creates relationships. And I think in a world where trust is a commodity that's hard to come by, I mean, you know, I, I always say once upon a time, you could trust everything. You could trust the banks and the government and the church and whomever, you know, it was, it was easy. Um, we can't trust very much anymore. We can't even trust our own health or public health. Um, we've gone through and, you know, the level of communication and information is so broad that it's really hard to know what we can and can't trust nowadays. But we can trust authentic story and we can trust the connection of the personal and the business if it feels real. Because, as I said before, you can't fake authenticity. And that builds trust and that is really good for business. So I would like to think that anybody who I've ever done business with has trusted me that I'm going to take care of them when I work with them. And if they, if ever the trust gets broken, then that relationship can't grow. And that means, you know, pretty soon it's going to separate and there's not going to be any more business interaction. I think that if you're not willing to bring yourself, your true self, your true authentic self into the business situation, you're losing out. That's awesome. If we put our instructional design hat on, like as a course creator, let's say we're making some content and it's known in like schools and <clears> universities, <throat> the value of like a case study to, which is a story to teach a point or further elaborate it. If you're, if we're teaching like a process or something, how as an instructional designer, should we think about the mix of theory and story, like within content? Am I, yeah, uh, I mean, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. yeah totally. And, and I spent a lot of time working in, you know, I do a lot of work with organizations around story and I've worked a lot with the big kind of corporate, um, you know, the computer scientists and the coders and everything and the engineers for whom story is, you know, ridiculous. It's just not something they're used to or feel comfortable with. But what I always say to them is at the end of the day, every process is impacting a user and every user is a human being and the human being has a human experience. The story speaks to the human experience. So every process that we design is going to, you know, it's going to ultimately impact behavior. So we need to tell the stories about that behavior and we need to tell the stories about the people who are using and building and designing and ultimately being impacted by the process or by the system. Um, and, and that's what happens. People rely upon information. They, they feel safe in information. If I give them lots and lots of information, they'll, they'll know what to do and they'll know how to make a decision. But in reality, we make decisions based on our emotions all the time, based on how we feel in the situation. So if we can speak to that in our instructional design, then that's it's not instead of the process or the or the tech piece but it adds onto it and it brings it alive and apart from anything else it makes it more interesting courses that are completely devoid of story are really hard to get through because they're just not that interesting i love that is there a place for made up stories like parables well you know you've touched on a, a an important point for me because as a traditional storyteller yeah. and a professional traditional storyteller i love um everything to do with fairy tales and folk tales and in fact i have a podcast called once upon a business and what i do is i take fairy tales and folk tales and then i get, interpret the lesson for business oh that's cool um, so yeah so that's a place if you want to you know if, if anybody listening wants to get a taste for like how how would a fairy tale impact business that's the place to go and there's a bunch i don't know there's like 2025 20, we just started it last year 2025 20, episodes where each episode is a story and then we talk about the lesson for entrepreneurs and for coaches and for for course builders um i think there's a lot of space because these stories are you know, these are age old stories that have come through all the different types of um communities and cultures to bring us lessons and stories that 
one are incredibly compelling that we remember all our life, but also they teach lessons that are just as relevant today as they were hundreds of years ago when they were first created. So yes, I, I love using them. It's not for everybody. The people that I've taught storytelling to over the years, some people are like, I never want to use a fairy tale. And that's fine. I personally think they're so rich and they're so layered and there's so much meaning embedded in them that um, it's a fantastic source of inspiration. How about as a business person, social media and stories, like whether it's TikTok or Facebook or YouTube or whatever, there's kind of like the business stories we can tell, but there's also like just sharing personal life to resonate with yeah. uh, behind the scenes content. But how, yeah, I mean, it's any it, tips on social media? Cause it can be somewhat overwhelming and what you've kind of already mentioned, like things to share, things to not share, but any just tips around social? Well, I think with social, at the end of the day, oftentimes we're interested in social because we're interested in seeing the behind the scenes version, right? So social is a lot of behind the supposed behind the scenes, actually. And that's where the inauthenticity comes along because it's supposed to be behind the scenes, but it's so practiced, you know? Um, I think that when we tell personal stories or we share these snippets of our personal life or our personal experience, it's what draws attention. At the end of the day, social media, there's so much out there, it can be overwhelming. But if we can tune in on something that's memorable, then we're going to have impact. And stories are what we remember. So, yes, um, the challenge is always like, how do I tell a story in however many uh, minutes or however many um, words that we're limited by in social media? Um, but I always think with story, less is more anyway. We want to be very careful about telling a story in a very specific and exact way. And stories can be as simple as a one sentence. There can be a whole story embedded in a sentence. That's awesome. What's in the book, The Story Advantage? What's in the book? Well, there's lots in the book. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it, firstly, there's lots of stories in there. Every chapter starts with a story, so that's fun. Um, quick question on that, quick question on that. Like for a, yeah. like, let's say a lesson, about learning, uh, like a lesson in a course, do you think it's better to put the story at the beginning or after the theory? You, you just said in your book, or and maybe it was a place for both, but just any tips there? Yeah, it kind of depends. Like I, I think stories at the beginning, like for example, for speaking engagements or for live training, I always put a story at the beginning because it grabs people's attention and then you have their engagement and they're much more willing to be open to learn something if they're fully engaged. So I'll often start with a story, but when I'm teaching something, oftentimes I'll use a story as a way to, to, to give an example so that it, so that you teach something and people kind of get it theoretically. And then when you put the example in place, they're like, oh, okay, that's how it works. And then they really embed the learning. So it can work both ways. It just depends in every situation, like what's, and this is part of the process and it's in the book, by the way, of understanding like, what is the intention that I'm putting into telling this story? What, what intention do I have? What do I want to create as an outcome for the person listening or reading or, or learning from this story? And what's my core message? And what, you have to go through this process. It's a five-step process. It's in the book all about understanding like what is the way that we design the story that's going to have the most impact in the moment. And part of that five-step process is what is the resistance people have to this story in this moment? And can I embed that resistance so that they know that I see them and I hear them, and I feel them as I tell the story? So, um, yeah, I mean, that's part of what's in the book. And we also look at like, how do you find your stories? How do you craft them? What are the ways to build out a story? What are all the elements of story? And ultimately, like, how do you tell a story in an effective way? That's awesome. That's Lisa Bloom. She's from story-coach.com. Go check out her book, The Story Advantage. You can find that on the website. And then Once Upon a Business is the podcast anywhere yeah. else. The good people can connect with you, Lisa. They're really the core places: the website, the podcast, um, and the book. Yeah, that's it. Um, I mean, I'm everywhere in social media. I'm not big into social media myself. It just kind of happens in the background. But um, the uh, all the core content you can get from the site and the book and so on. So yeah, that's where to find them. Awesome. Well, Lisa, thanks for coming on the show and sharing your story with us. We really appreciate it. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. And that's a wrap for this episode of LMS Cast. Did you enjoy that episode? Tell your friends and be sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. And I've got a gift for you over at LMS 
lifterlms.com forward slash gift. Go to lifterlms.com forward slash gift. Keep learning, keep taking action, and I'll see you in the next episode.